All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope everyone had a good lunch. Hope the keynote was wonderful. I thought it was engaging. So you're here with us with Angelina Meadows from the OER Project. She's going to give us an overview. Um, totally fine. We understand it's after lunch. Sometimes we've got our, our non-traditional workmates that need attention. I know I've got at least two. Um, but just in the chat, there's an attendance survey for you. Please don't forget to do that so you can get that wonderful professional learning credit and or college credit, whatever floats your boat. And with that being said, if you have any technical issues, please just message me um, individually and I'll help take care of those. Uh, that being said, I'm gonna hand it over to Angelina. Welcome, welcome to the session. I'm here to provide just a very general overview of what the OER project is. So I'm Angelina, I'm the education partner manager with the OER project. So I get to work with the fabulous Janie Malroney very, uh, very often. Uh, we get to talk and plan wonderful things for the state of Nevada. So most of the professional learning that the OER project is doing this year has been the culmination of Janie and I talking. So um, <laughs> that is uh, what I'm here to kind of present for you today is just what is this thing called the OER project? Because the word OER has many different names. So why are, are we here and what do we do? And so let's get started. On the screen right now is just a QR code. If you look at that with your phone and just take a picture of it or hover over it with the picture app on your phone, you can open up our OER project website. If you don't have an account, you can register for an account right through that QR code, and that will take you to all of our free goodies. So first and foremost, I'm going to go over a quick agenda, do a quick icebreaker, talk to you about what the OER project is, what courses we offer, give you some overviews of those courses, how we align to standards, specifically in Nevada, and then talk about different reading, writing, and assessment practices in our courses and talk to you about next steps. Really, we want you to walk away with a very high-level overview about who we are, what's our philosophy, and determine if one of these courses is possibly a fit for you. Not necessarily that you have to go back tomorrow into your classroom and, you know, jump in both feet whole hog and throw out every single thing you've ever been doing. But is there something that maybe you want to poke around and try to see if one of these courses may have something that would be suitable for you in the classes that you teach? So in the chat, simple, quick, where do you live? Where do you teach? What brought you to this session today? And what's your familiarity with the OER project and or its courses? And my favorite question is, what's the best store to window shop? And you can choose a, you know, definitely brick and mortar store, or you can choose something that's online, because I feel like my best shopping is done online. And maybe in the middle of the night when I can't sleep, um, which is probably not the best time I feel like to shop or window shop because I have made some questionable purchases that I don't remember making um, and they show up at my house and I find out like, oh, why did I get a cupping set that I didn't even know I live alone? Who would be using these on my back? <laughs> I... I I've had those middle of the night, like Amazon purchases. Like, what did I yeah. wake up and order now? Okay, yeah, yeah. The buy now button, I feel like was genius Amazon work. Like Jeff Bezos was like, that was his Einstein moment or whomever mm -hmm. decided that in his marketing team. So um, yeah. I think it's just you and me. So yeah. are you Lauren, Lindsay, Lisa? Uh, Rain. Rain. Oh, I love that name. Okay, Rain. Um, and where do you teach? Where do you live? Uh, I teach in Vegas. Okay. Uh, Western High School. I teach uh, 10th grade social uh, world history for the most part. I have a couple of different electives over the years, but mainly world history. Um, uh, I've used little bits of OER. Yeah. Uh, I know like during COVID, that's what 
they yes. put into the canvas course was like an yes. OER thing. And I've done a training on it. It was not the very best training. In fact, it kind of made me not want to use it at times. So that's why I'm joining here. Because the woman I took, tra- she's basically all she talked about was three close reads. And that was like basically all OER was for the big history project. And I'm like, I can't have my kids like that being everything we do. That just doesn't. Yep. And we do, and, and to be quite frank now, and I will say this, so, and I could have very well been that woman that trained you. Like if you, I mean, I'll put myself out there like that, but um, we do do trainings that are specific to some of our practices because that is something that we we believe very strongly in. You'll see that yeah. definitely in today's session. Um, because we think that it's important for you to understand like how to teach a practice. Um, But today's session is very, very broad, very much like here's the course in general. And then after this session, I'm actually doing the world history course, like a very 10,000 foot view of how's the world history course structured. Cause I'm a world history woman. That was what I taught in classroom Mm -hmm. for 15 years. It's my passion. It's my baby. I love world history. Um, But I do, I do hear that quite a bit when it's like, you know, what do I know about OER project? Oh, I know three close reads or, oh, uh, the other thing I get, or is, oh, I know Alphonse the camel. It's like these one-off things. Mm -hmm. And you, and if you get into the website, you're like, oh, it's really overwhelming. That's the other thing I hear. So we're going to talk about a little bit today about like, how do you dissect uh, that a little bit more so that you can kind of use it in whatever capacity, whether that's supplemental, um, p- poking around in Canvas, because we just updated and I sent the, the newest cartridge to New- Nevada where we updated the cartridge with our newest stuff. Okay. Um, to put in canvas. So like, how do you poke around? How do you see what you need? Things like that. So great. That's great feedback. Uh, and it probably was like just, and it, this was, I remember the train was like before COVID even hit. So, oh yeah. Yeah. And yeah. she, like, I didn't have any, it was really no prop, no training on the website. And so, like, yeah. so, so when I've tried to do things on the website, it is like, ah, but I have like chosen some of the different parts. Like we've done, uh, I forgot what his name is now, but someone's like the oh, I don't remember. We've done, <laughs> yeah. You pick yeah, and we've choose, used it right? before, but not as the website itself and stuff. Yeah. yeah, and and really, I mean, and we'll talk. Like yeah. I'll get into it, and you'll get a little bit more in depth. But you know, the website is meant to be manipulated manipulated by the teacher, right? To still be. Um, we put too much on there on purpose because we want teachers to be able to, um, you know, still create a class that has that vibe, that look, that feel that is responsive to the students that they have in their classroom. That is a, a place that feels like it's their authentic classroom. It fits their teaching style. It fits their state standards. It fits what the needs of the students are. And so the only way to do that is to have enough material to choose from to really be able to say, yes, this, not that. Um, but what that does then is if I'm a new teacher and I don't have that guide to, to walk me through, I look at the website and I'm like, Woo, that's overwhelming. And do you really expect me to teach all of this? And that's the immediate feel I get or vibe I get. And now I'm like, let me walk it back. And I, I don't have time to like sift through what's the difference between me sifting through all of that. And then me hitting a Google search up, right? Like is there, is there a quantifiable difference that I can, that I can tell right now? And, and the answer at that at first blush is, is in my mind, if I'm a new teacher is not really. So we're going to try to do that for you today. Okay. So what is OER? Like first and foremost, OER is anything. So OER is teachers pay teachers. OER is shag. OER is 
any of those things like are considered open educational resources, anything that you can go online and download for free that are open, that you don't have to pay to play. So, um, if you go to Harvard, sometimes they have like free units. iCivic sometimes has free units. All of that is considered an open educational resource. OER Project is free online, but we are comprehensive curriculum. So A to B. We see teachers as professionals. The one thing that is different for us is that we pair our curriculum with PD and we offer it all for free and we offer the comprehensive piece of curriculum. So we started um, with Big History Project. That's how we started over a decade ago now when I first got involved with the group. And then we moved on to offering World History Project and we that was a cute idea. We thought like, oh, we'll offer a World History course. <laughs> and then, um, we realized very quickly, like, oh, well, you know, all of these different states across the United States have different periodizations of world history. Some start with origins, you know, with hunting and gathering societies or even pre, you know, pre hunting and gathering societies. Others start at 1200 uh, with, you know, pre Columbian exchange. Others start with the industrial revolution, you know, like, so we ended up offering, you know, or creating three different um, world history courses. So that was quite the adventure. And then most recently this past summer, we onboarded an AP world history course that was actually approved by the college board as a college board textbook. So it is the only free completely comprehensive curriculum that is approved by college board as a text. So that's super cool because for us, one of our missions is to take, uh, not take down, but to help move into spaces that um, kids don't have access to high quality textbooks. This is an opportunity to do that for students that can't keep paying for AP tax over and over and over and over again. Now we have, this as an option. And now we're doing a three-week extension course called the Climate Project that looks as, at climate as a civic action project. And how do you do, uh, how do you look at climate as a civic participation issue? Looking at it from uh, a localization, like how do you do that from um, a school board doing something locally? How do you do it from a public works getting a bill passed to deal with climate or um, looking at it from an infrastructure and doing an economic proposal to get it, something that way passed? So that's going to be a very cool kind of extension um, to add to a civics course. So the common threads are the fact that we offer that PD, we have the scaffolds, we have standards-based classes, we weave in the C3 framework, everything's inquiry-based, all those good things that we know set us apart. We're not a lesson repository. You don't just get one-off lessons. We have this comprehensive curriculum if you so choose to use it. Now, of course, you can go in and pull off a specific lesson or a video or an activity or a whatever and use it at that way. But if you want, you can have a 187 day curriculum. It's, it's really the world is kind of your oyster. So it's the best of both worlds as a teacher myself. Um, and when we, uh, we talk to teachers about this, we say, the idea here is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater with the classes you already teach. If there's good things you're already doing that the kids get the idea, they're already proficient, they do really well, and it's hitting exactly the standard that you want it to hit, and you know it, and you have a way to measure that, keep doing it. Do that. You already know it's working. Just supplement with this work too. You know, it's it's not meant to usurp. It's meant to kind of be this marriage between what you're doing as a good professional and now here, here's a way to enhance. 
So that's the, that's how curriculum works. That's why teaching is an art and a science. You know, we talk about treating teachers as professionals. This is the way to do it. Um, so what are our courses? So number one, we've got big history, the founding father. Um, this is the history of the world from the big bang to the present. And so this was a course that was developed out of the work of a man called David Christian. He wrote this text called Maps of Time. He's um, an English historian that was transplanted to Australia working at Macquarie University. Um, we work out of Bill Gates' private office. People think that I work in Bill Gates in the foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I've actually never been there. Um, I don't. Uh, Bill has a private office. It's like his innovation studio. That's where we work. So Bill was running on his treadmill, watching DVDs of the Great Courses series and watched David Christian doing this lecture. And he said, oh my gosh, if I had this big history course in high school, I would be so smart, which is like a really funny joke that someone would make. Um, if they weren't Bill. But when Bill says it, you're like, oh, cool. Yeah. So he really went down this rabbit hole, called David Christian and said, hey, I want to make your course into a high school course. And I want to make it free for every high schooler in the entire United States to take. How do I do that? And David Christian was like, <laughs> that's funny. And Bill was like, no, I'm really serious. And so this is how this course was born. So it's called the Framework for All Knowledge. It's a fantastic course, but basically over 10 years, what we ended up figuring out is because it's so incredibly interdisciplinary, where it fits best is actually in middle school. It's a great high school course as an elective which is actually where I taught it. I taught it as a senior elective, as like almost like a capstone course, um, which was very cool for seniors to take as a capstone because it brought a lot of their learning together. They loved it. But as a middle school class, as an interdisciplinary class, that's what we're, you know, kind of moving it down with the reading and writing rubrics. Um, pushing it down into middle school and middle school teachers are loving teaching it. So now it's time for the world history project. So world history is obviously ideal for the world history classroom. The reason world history is super different than the regular, when I got my first world history textbook, I think we all remember this day. Um, it was fantastic. It was a fantastic day. I'm sure we all were remember the day when they're like, here's your schedule. You're teaching world history. And you're like, cool. And they're like, here's your textbook. And you're like, okay. And they're like, you're like, okay, so what am I teaching? And they're like, here's your textbook. And you're like, awesome. And so then you had to figure it out from there. Did you have that same experience, Rain? Yes. And then we realized, oh, here's your textbook that was published in like 1994. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. The Berlin Wall falls and like That's history it. is done. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was, that was my, that was the epitome of history for me as well. So I'm so glad. I, I really, honestly, I share that story all the time. And I mean, I started teaching like 20 years ago now. Oh my gosh, it was forever. But it that that narrative is not changed. Like I see young teachers, we do like a new teacher series, like sub five years of teaching, and they still have that same experience. And I'm like, oh, my heart, it's breaking. And so the reason we set this course up different from the start is because what anyone that has taught world history for five minutes knows is that there is no way to teach it all. There is, there is no way to teach it all. You drive yourself crazy, either A, trying, or B, it becomes the most boring class in the world for your kids because it's a slug through time. 
and you just you just slug your way through time and you end up feeling like did i even make any connections i know that i went from this part of time to that part of time to that part of time to that part of time but did i really teach them how people in the enlightenment really really have fundamentally changed how we think of the world today did i really connect those two dots for them so for us we thought we really need to look at the structures of these courses and we really need to think about how are we going to structure them what's going to be the periodization how are we going to put these pieces of this puzzle together and what are we going to do and so these are the three different course structures like i mentioned before the cute idea that we were just going to make one world history course that was adorable um i when bob said that the first time i was like oh okay bob is our our director i was like you're gonna make one world history course huh let me know how that goes for you and like two minutes later, he came back. He goes, we can't make one course. I was like, yep, you can't make one course. <laughs> so I deal with state standards and like I deal with working with state departments of education. So I just, it was cute. I was like, I was just waiting for how long it would take him. Um, but so this is, this is fantastic. But the other part that what we realized was if we're going to make any really good world history class, we need to figure out how are we going to frame this for kids. And so we came up with not only framing it around skills, because world history sits usually in that 910 spot, or where an I taught it, we taught it to juniors because they put a or they put they pushed AP um, and civics down. So we taught it to juniors. So it's gotta be based in skills. But the other thing is, is you've gotta put some frames in it. You've gotta say, what are gonna be the things that we're gonna look at throughout this whole year? We're gonna look at culture. We're gonna look at production and distribution. We're going to look at narratives whose whose story is being told and whose story is not being told every time we look at a specific era every time we look at a particular space every time we look at an event whose story is being told whose story is not being told and we're going to look at networks of exchange what is what is happening what what economically is occurring here and as soon as you put those frames in and you underpin it with skills, now you constantly have talking points. You have pins to drop every single time. It's, then you can say, okay, let's talk about World War I and let's talk about production and distribution. Now we have this conversation. Kids can constantly be thinking about that. Your historian's journal can constantly be tracking that. Everything can now be going back to that. And you've created those threads. It's no longer a march through time. It's now a fruitful conversation where you're always connecting the dots. And I feel like just adding that simple tweak, that simple structure to this course changed the game for me in a way that I don't think I got to b before, you know, in my own teaching, um, on my own, I needed that little push. And so the other thing that I love is that these progression placemats. So for me, um, if you try to do all these skills every year, um, that this would be my straw breaking the camel's back moment. Uh, I try to pick, do you do SLOs? 
like student learning objectives or evaluation something somethings or whatever you do in your district yes. or whatever? Yes, we do the like like those student learning goals or okay. Yeah. So in Michigan, I live in Michigan. So we always had to tie them to data that never had to do with social studies because there was never a social studies standardized test. Mm -hmm. And so, especially at the secondary level. Um, so for me, I was always like, mm, okay, great. We're going to use this random ELA test that really doesn't have anything to do with me. And they're like, well, if you can make up your own, okay, sounds good. What I like about this practice progression placemat is I can look at one of these skills in one of these disciplines and I can say from unit one to unit 10 of world history, I am practicing this particular skill all year. And I can only choose one or I can choose two and I can do a pre, my unit one activity is my pre and my unit 10 activity is my post. And I know that it's tracking that skill all year and I can see the growth of that student. And that for me makes the difference. And I can create like a rubric, right? I can create a little rubric that says, this is what I'm looking for. Or if I'm gonna do something with, the, with writing or with claim or whatever it is, we have a writing rubric and I can look at that. But this gives me that opportunity to do that pre and post. And I don't have to, you know, some teachers, bless them, want all of this. They're like, I, I'm going whole hog. I'm doing every skill. Well, go it, go for it. I, yes, I start small. I want to dip my toes in. I want to see how my students respond. And I also want to try something that they're either, I want to do two things. I want to do something that they're, I know they're A, already good at and see if they can get better. And then B, something that they're struggling with and see if they can get better. I want to do something that I'm going to get confirmation bias of. This isn't going to make them worse. And then I want to do something that is this going to make them better and then go from there. And if I click on this practice progression placemat, this hyperlinks right to those activities. I don't even have to search on the website because this is going to take me right to them. So that I like too. Um, but this, this was really helpful for me um, just because I could pick and choose and go to the places I needed to. So those are kind of like my two, just if I'm starting out with world history, you know, three close reads is great. I'm not knocking your earlier training because that's a great practice, but you can't three close reads everything. You got to use it sparingly, right? Because you and I both know if you three close reads everything, they will, yeah, yeah they're going to slash your tires. You got to do it sparingly throughout the year which is not bad, right? Like reading is very important and that's not a bad thing to do. But this I think also works if you do something like that. Yeah. So between the frames, your practice progression placemats to get at your goal work, you're good to go. And it gives you kind of a sense of, I know I'm working on a skill, I'm getting the job done. It's going to hit at the topics I need to cover anyway. And now I'm good to go. So just to kind of give you a little brief overview, because I just want to do a time check. Um, the AP course is fantastic. It is completely different. So we didn't just take world history and then retrofit it for AP. We made a whole new course. Um, we took the CED for AP and then started building from there. Um, so the CED alignment is, is what it is. That is the first most important document, which is why I think College Board was happy to support our course because we decided that the CED was the number one most important thing. So you'll even see that our periodization is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, we added a unit zero back into the course when we piloted it 
we just decided like, we'll just go with APs courses or units and we'll just go one through nine and just be done. But we added a unit zero back in and we said, this is optional because we still felt like students needed a soft place to jump off of. Even if you do it as like summer work, or I know some teachers do like AP homework and, you know, or they do a, a small abbreviated unit at the beginning. We just thought that it was really important to give them that pilot, like soft launch. And then same for everything else. We're going to organize those lessons. We're going to group them. We're going to align those topics just like we do with all of our other courses. And our course assets are going to be done as a thematic focus, similar to what AP is looking for with those historical developments, those learning objectives. The historical developments are written right in there with the guiding questions and then adding in those illustrative examples, all built right in there on those maps so that everything is kind of like turnkey, press the button, ready to go, so that the teachers are um, really just, they're at the ready. What we're finding in our research is that <laughs> AP World uh, and AP World teachers are kind of the newbies so a lot of people that are new to AP get AP World. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> I feel like this is a hard one to teach. And a lot of people just get thrown into that. And I, that was not my experience. I never taught AP. Um, so I, we, and we didn't even offer it at my school. We offered AP Euro. So, um, and, and I did not, I did not, really think that that was true, but that is what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was, I was kind of blown away by that actually. So the AT, uh, AP alignment, talking about those unit problems and really the next step for us, because we don't really do assessment, like assessments for our other courses. We do practice questions, um, but we don't build assessments. We do writing essay, like we do essay writing um, or longer passage writing. Um, but we, the reason we don't do assessment creation and development is because I don't know the students in your classroom. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of irresponsible of me or our organization to say like, here's a good assessment. I can only write an assessment based on the content. I can't write an assessment based on what you emphasized or how you taught it or this being responsive to the students that you need or if you have any unique learning needs in your classroom or any of those things. So I would hate for a new teacher or a, you know, a teacher that is just learning to come and just hit the kids with that assessment. And then, oh my goodness, you know, I, we, we would never want that to happen. So we leave the assessing up to the practitioners, <laughs> but with AP, obviously it's a little different because it's built as a college course. So we're still thinking about ways to like build in practice questions and question sets and things like that. But what you're going to see is the same skills development and skill alignment that we do in our other courses we're adding into or is added into I should say AP but it's added into as you can see like a more instead of woven into the class itself it's added into its own separate section so here's the skills and it, the historical thinking skills and processes. It's its own separate like part of the unit or its own separate set of lessons so that teachers can teach them aside from the content. And so where in our world history class or big history or climate or whatever it is, they're woven within the content. So you're teaching industrialization and sourcing at the same time, this is, aside from that, so that the kids are just practicing that skill because it's separated on the exam. Yeah. So then finally, we're just gonna hit climate project extension really quickly. So again, this is a three, three week unit 
teachers are teaching this in a variety of different ways. So yes, it's a civics-based unit. Some teachers are teaching it throughout the entire year. They're like introducing it in the first couple of weeks and then um, kids are doing a little bit every, you know, marking period or every uh, end of every unit, whatever it is, because the majority of it is you're building up to learning uh, or doing your own kind of action research project. And so really the, the premise of the course is figuring out a solution to get to net zero carbon by 2050. So there's five grand challenges that we have to face in order to, or five grand challenges that we're facing as we look to solve this problem. And how would we do that? When we're looking at civics, you know, um, the, the kind of premises, most of the issues that we've looked at thus far are scientific in nature. We've looked at, you know, how many more engineers do we need? Or how many more scientists do we need? Or how many more of this do we need? Well, now we have to look at civics or we need to look at social studies. And we need to think about how many more senators do we need on our side to solve this problem? Or, you know, how many more federal judges do we need that are gonna pass legislation? Um, or, um, you know, rule favorably on legislation that comes or rulings that come down the pipe. So this is really developed for high school students, but we've seen even teachers in elementary um, talk about this in terms of looking at it for grand challenges for their building and how they can solve these challenges within their building. So very cool, the different ways that teachers are approaching this. Um, but all of our course content, as you've seen, as you've poked around, we've got great articles that you can Lexile level, which I love that students can choose their own Lexile level. The only class that we can't do that in is AP, obviously, because it's a college level course, all the good activities, different videos, um, the ones that we shot during COVID, we're working on reshooting. <laughs> Just because it's so awkward, like, to sit there with your iPhone and shoot a video, but working on that. And then we're continually adding to those graphic biographies. Um, most of those are really focusing on voices that aren't typically discussed in history. That's who we focus on. Um, the other cool thing that we just actually got done doing last week in New Mexico was we are building an indigenous arc into our world history course. So that was supposed to happen pre-COVID. <laughs> and um, we, uh, for all the, all the reasons, which we totally understand, mm -hmm. um, could not get into the Pueblos during COVID understandably. Yeah. Um, so we were just now able to go and film in the Pueblos last week. And so we are able to, um, we're in finishing production on those and we'll have those uploaded to the site here, hopefully like anytime, but the arc will go from, you know, very early pre, like the earliest Americas to um, indigenous Americans today. And what is, you know, what is, what are indigenous Americans doing? Because I think that that's the, uh, argument that, um, indigenous Americans make most often when we talk about world history is they're here and their story isn't told, um, that, you know, we talk about manifest destiny and things like that. And then their story ends. So um, we want to make sure that that isn't the case in, in our curriculum. So it should be awesome. So graphic biographies are continuing. I mean, obviously this arc is gonna be more than just graphic biographies, but um, those are continuing to be a huge piece. And then just the scaffolds that we provide, you know, going from a very hooky type activity like Alphonse the Camel, which kids just, remember forever with Frank the camel killer 
putting a straw on Alphonse's back and them having to figure out causation, you know, what was the triggering event? What was the long-term cause? Was it that Alphonse was born with a, you know, small hoof birth defect, or was it, you know, that he had to walk up these mountains long hours? Was it that camels failed to unionize? Like it, you know, these long causes to, you know, causal mapping to, you know, these, these other small scaffolds that you can just implement at any point. Uh, it's just, these are cool pieces that you obviously can use our, our tools, but you don't have to, you can just look at them for reference and then say, oh, I could do that with whatever. And then finally standards alignment. So if there's ever a situation where you're like, hmm, not sure, hmm, not sure. On our website, we have teacher resources. You can click right on there. It'll say exactly Nevada, where our standards align, and you can go from there. And recently, in the next couple of months, we're also going to have it updated with all of our CEU information. So how you can go and get continuing education units for PD and things like that after the fact. And then, as you know, our three close reads approach, our reading um, approach, which is, you know, I think it's so funny. It's not ours. Uh, it's just the best practice reading yeah. approach. Um, but we've implemented it pretty widely in our course, and it's just proven to work. And then yeah. our approach to writing, I think, is, is pretty unique as well. So. We talk about LEQs, long essay questions, document-based essay questions. We have our um, automated scoring system called, you know, SCORE, which is the, you know, artificial intelligence that will help score essays for you. We have all of these different things that are in our writing, but I think the one thing that we talk about the most is the fact that, um, kids just write a whole lot in our course and we don't expect teachers to grade it. Yeah. And the reason being is because you don't need to. <laughs> um, half the time they just need to write because they need to think through the end of a pencil. And we, we forget that, you know, um, I'm sure that I, I mean, I might be the only one I was, my teacher would make me write sentences for every vocab term, like come up with your own sentence, come up with your own sentence. And at the time I was like, am I going crazy? Right. But I think that that helped me remember vocabulary, you know, as crazy as that was, we don't do that kind of thing anymore because you know, we've gotten away from it. Not that that's the best practice either, but I think that there is something to just having kids write more, write answers, write their historian's notebook, do a daily journal, do an exit ticket, whatever it is. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to be graded, but it does mean that they're getting their ideas out of their head and onto paper. And it's not in a digital format. I think that there is something tactile to writing. And so that's the other piece of our approach to assessment, you know, practice quizzes for lessons, but it's all about that formative assessment. And we talk about it as informative, um, necessary, not everything needs to be summative, but it does need to inform. It needs to help you know what your next step is to teach. It needs to help you determine what you should be doing next to help with your students. And if they need to repeat a skill set or repeat an activity, that's the other reason why we give so many options, because if you do an activity and they didn't necessarily hit the mark and not every kid's proficient, well, let's read an article then. And if maybe they don't get it after that, well, then let's watch the video. And so we give multiple iterations of something so that you have that flexibility. Or if a kid is saying, I'm well past, I'm well past this, uh, you know, I've already got this. Well, you've got enough in that 
other materials section to say, well, then check out these three things. You don't have to search and scour. It's already there. Or if somebody is, you know, a little bit behind, you can say, well, here's two or three things that they can look at that's going to help reinforce it's already there for them that you can assign right into their system, into their platform that, again, you're not creating and taking extra time away from you. And I think that that's, there's some beauty there too um, that we don't think of. Yes, it's a little bit like, oh, I've got to look, but there's a little bit of friendliness there. Yes. So on ongoing next steps, you know, our teacher community is wonderful. If you go into our teacher community, it on the if you go and you hit the community button, and I'll show you in a second. Um, you can click right here, and I can take you over here. So I will stop share, and then I can reshare. Let's see, we're right here. So our teacher community, if you are on like our regular homepage, which is here, and this is what it looks like when you're logged in, if you hit this community button and you go to forums, this is our teacher community. You can ask anything you want here. Teachers will share absolutely anything from tests to uh, like, I mean, you name it, they will share it. And there are people on here all the time that will answer your question in minutes. Bless you. So mm -hmm. like quiz, quizzes and exams. Hi, Susan. Well, I've heard it, like they hey, here, here you go. Yeah. Like they're just happy. Here's her, here's her questions. <laughs> she just cut and pasted her test like <laughs> in here. So people are happy to just put whatever they want. If you're looking for other professional development opportunities, they're all right here. Or you can go to any of our session recordings. We've got them all here. Um, or you can go to events and then see them like this way. I like to do that because I need to know what day on my calendar because that's how my life works. Um, the other piece uh, of, of this is, like I said, on the, on the course itself. So let's go here. My absolute favorite button in this whole course, if we go into any of the units, let's go liberal and national revolutions. I can say you're not sharing. I've been able to follow along with you all the way up until here. Oh, you're, I'm not sharing. You've got to yell at no, me sooner. No, I was able to follow along with everything. Like as you were saying it. Oh, just yell at me I was sooner. like, I just lost that one. <laughs> okay, here. Okay, okay. This is my favorite button when I am in a unit. Okay. Mm -hmm. You ready for it? Right yes. here. View lesson. This is if I'm absent, it's my lesson plan for my teacher. Because it tells you exactly everything. When to stop the video, when to do the things. It tells you when you just see all the tiles of all the little lessons together and you're like, I don't know what goes with what, this tells you what goes with what. So this tells you, oh, these two things go together. And here is how you do them. And then, oh, here's why this video is important. And oh, these three go together. So that view lesson button is like my savior. Yes. Because it takes all those little boxes and it gives them meaning instead of just trying to like, 
click them open and try to figure out for yourself what what do these all mean that to me is the the this the key to success yes okay what other questions do you have for me because the moderator's coming back on and she's <laughs> about to wrap me up you have a minute <laughs> I mean, just one question is, do you have an ability for your articles? Is, yeah. there, you know, is there an ability in there to translate? To translate them to what? Other languages. Other languages. I teach a, one of my, a couple of my classes are world history for ELLs. So I have like, say in one class, 20 newcomers with no English background. So if you go to the unit page, okay. you have to open up Google Translate but not the Chrome extension. Okay. So you have to open up the actual web page, And then if you go here to the text reader, okay. you, can, you can download it as a Word doc and put it in Google Translate mm -hmm. and you can Google Translate it. Okay, okay. But it, it cannot be the extension on Chrome. 